today's video lecture, we're going to be talking about the effects of an excise tax on a particular good or service. Let's begin by defining an excise tax. An excise tax is defined as a specific or an ad valorem tax placed by the government on a particular good or service. So this raises the question, what is the difference between a specific excise tax and an ad valorem excise tax? Let's distinguish between these two different types of excise tax now. A specific tax is basically a tax of a specific amount paid on every unit of a product sold. An example of this is a $2 tax on each pack of cigarettes. In contrast, an ad valorem tax is another type of excise, excise tax that is based on a particular percentage of the sales price of a product. For instance, a 50% tax on a pack of cigarettes would be considered an, an ad valorem tax. This differs from an excise tax in that it is not always the same dollar amount, rather it is based on a percentage of the sales price. In the graph on the right, we're going to be examining the impact of a specific tax on the market for cigarettes. In other words, we'll be looking at what happens to the market for cigarettes if the government is to place a $2 tax per pack of cigarettes. Looking at the graph on the right, we have the demand for cigarettes and the supply of cigarettes. We can see the demand is downward sloping, supply of course is upward sloping, Without any government intervention at all, the equilibrium price of cigarettes will be $5 and the equilibrium quantity of cigarettes sold will be 30,000 packs of cigarettes. Now what will happen when there is a $2 tax on each pack of cigarettes sold? Remember from previous units that the, mar that the supply curve for a good like cigarettes represents the marginal cost curve. Therefore, any tax on cigarettes will e essentially increase the marginal cost of providing cigarettes, since the tax ultimately must be paid by cigarette producers. We can view the effect of a $2 tax as an upward shift of the marginal cost curve by $2. In essence, a tax of $2 per pack of cigarettes means that cigarette producers now face an additional cost of $2 for every pack of cigarettes they sell. The impact that this will have on the market for cigarettes will be seen as an increase in the marginal cost of cigarettes or another way of saying that is a decrease in the supply of cigarettes. And since we know that the tax is two dollars we know that this supply curve will shift upwards by an amount of two dollars. All we have to do now is connect these dots and we should see our new supply of cigarettes curve. As can be seen, the supply of cigarettes has decreased due to the tax on cigarettes. Another way of seeing this is that the marginal cost of cigarettes has increased by $2 at every quantity. So the vertical distance between the original supply curve and the new supply curve represents the actual amount of the tax. We can call this new supply curve supply with tax. Now let's examine the impact that this $2 tax on each pack of cigarettes has on the equilibrium quantity and the equilibrium price of cigarettes, and we'll examine who bears most of the burden of this $2 tax. Whether consumers or producers bear most of the burden depends on the responsiveness of producers and consumers to this $2 tax. First, let's see how the $2 tax affects the quantity demanded and the price of cigarettes. At first instinct, it might appear that a $2 tax on each pack of cigarettes will raise the price of cigarettes by $2 for consumers. However, once we look at our diagram, we can see that this is not necessarily the case. First of all, the tax leads to a decrease in the quantity demanded. This makes sense because clearly the price is higher than it was before. However, what we also notice is that the price of cigarettes does not increase by the full $2 of the tax. In fact, our new equilibrium price is somewhere between 6 and seven dollars on this graph whereas the original equilibrium price was five dollars you would think that with a two dollar tax the price of cigarettes might raise to six dollars but this is not the case let's explain why the decrease in the supply leads to an increase in the price and a decrease in the quantity demanded however the price does not increase by the full two dollars this is because consumers demand for cigarettes is not perfectly inelastic if it were, if consumers were totally unresponsive to changes in the price of cigarettes, then it's highly likely that the producers of cigarettes would simply raise the price of each pack by $2, leading to no decrease in the quantity demanded. However, clearly the demand for cigarettes is downward sloping, therefore consumers are somewhat responsive to the change in price of cigarettes. Producers would find that if they were to raise the price of cigarettes by the full $2, 
then the quantity demanded would fall so much that the producers of cigarettes would suffer unnecessarily. Therefore, they only raise the price by, according to our graph here, around $1.20, as we can see here. On the other hand, the, the 80 cents that still must be paid towards the tax comes out of the pockets of producers. We can see that producers ultimately accept a lower price for the cigarettes of around $4.20. So we can see here that the new equilibrium price of $6 is about $2 more than the price that producers ultimately get to keep which is somewhere above four dollars so what we see is that the price that consumers pay of just over six dollars minus the two dollar tax tells us the price that producers of cigarettes get to keep now we see that the price has increased but not by the full two dollars but the price that consumers pay includes part of the two dollar tax the price that producers keep subtracts some of that two dollar tax Therefore, the tax burden is shared between producers and consumers. Tax burden refers to the amount of the tax paid by producers and the amount of the tax paid by consumers. The area I'm about to shade in blue, the area above the old price of $5 and below the new price of around $6.20, represents the amount of this tax or the share of this $2 tax paid by consumers of cigarettes. The area I'm shading in green represents the tax burden of the producers of cigarettes. We see that since producers had to accept a lower price for their packs of cigarettes, they share some of the burden of the tax. Also, since consumers have to pay a higher price, they share some of the burden of the tax. I've called the blue rectangle CB for consumer burden and the green rectangle PB for producer burden. As we can see here, the increase in the price that consumers pay is greater than the decrease in the price that producers get to keep. This means that the consumers bear a larger burden of the tax on cigarettes than producers do. Another way of saying that is that the blue rectangle here is larger than the green rectangle, indicating that the consumer tax burden is greater than the producer tax burden. The next thing we want to look at is the net effect on total welfare by which we mean consumer and producer surplus in the market for cigarettes. As can be seen, before the tax was imposed, the original price of cigarettes was only $5, and the original quantity was 30,000 packs of cigarettes. Now that the price is higher, around $6.20, the quantity of cigarettes demanded is lower, only 25,000 cigarettes, or just below 25,000. In addition, consumers pay a higher price, therefore there is less consumer surplus than there was before. The area I'm shading in purple represents the consumer surplus after the tax. Before the tax, of course, the consumer surplus would have been a much larger triangle since consumers enjoyed a lower price and enjoyed a, a greater quantity of cigarettes. The purple triangle here represents consumer surplus after the $2 tax on cigarettes. Does this necessarily mean that producers are better off since consumers are worse off? In fact, Producers of cigarettes are also worse off because of the tax. The reason for this is that they get to keep a lower price now than they did before. Whereas before the tax, producers were receiving $5 per pack. After the tax, producers are receiving just over $4 per pack. So the area of producer surplus is now smaller than it was before, below $4.20 and above the price intercept of $1 and above the supply curve. So the yellow triangle here represents producer surplus following the tax. We've got consumer surplus after the tax. We've got producer surplus after the tax. And this leaves one small area that used to be community surplus or total welfare before the tax was imposed, but is, but is now no longer enjoyed by producers or consumers. This little triangle on the right here, which I am outlining in black, represents the loss of welfare resulting from the tax. In economics, we refer to this as the dead weight loss of the tax. Because this tax led to higher prices for consumers and lower prices for producers, the overall welfare among consumers and producers in the market for cigarettes is less than it was before. But this raises one question. Why, if the consumer tax burden and the producer tax burden are losses of welfare to consumers and producers are these not considered deadweight loss. The reason for that is that this two dollars right here 
actually goes to government. It's not a loss of welfare. This will go to the government, which it can then be used for the provision of public goods and services, such as health education or uh, public schools or for infrastructure projects. Therefore, the sum of the consumer tax burden and the producer tax burden which is the rectangle I'm outlining in red, represents tax revenue for the government, resulting from the tax on cigarettes. So the red rectangle here represents government tax revenue. It is not deadweight loss because the government enjoys this income that it raises from the tax on cigarettes. However, there is a net loss of total welfare among smokers and cigarette producers equal to the black triangle here. We can see that the $2 tax on cigarettes reduced the quantity supplied and demanded in the market for cigarettes from around 30,000 packs to just below 25,000 packs. We can also see that it raised the price that consumers pay for cigarettes from $5 to just over $6. This $1.20 increase did not encompass the full $2 of the tax because producers share part of that tax burden by accepting a lower price when they've paid the tax to the government. Here we see that a specific excise tax of $2 per pack of cigarettes is shared by the consumers of cigarettes and the producers of cigarettes. The decrease in the supply of cigarettes corresponds with an increase in the marginal cost to cigarette producers resulting from the fact that they have to now pay a $2 tax to government for every pack. However, since the demand for cigarettes is relatively inelastic, and we'll explore this more in our next video podcast, the consumers of cigarettes end up sharing a larger burden of this tax than the producers of cigarettes. They are relatively unresponsive to increases in the price of cigarettes, therefore the producers pass most of the tax, around $1.20 of it, onto the consumers rather than paying the full $2 tax themselves. Producers only pay about $0.80 cents of this tax. Consumers pay $1.20 of this tax. Therefore, consumers bear a larger burden of the tax. In the next video, we're going to talk about how a tax on a good for which demand is relatively elastic will ultimately be borne more by producers than by consumers.